so just a brief introduction for my fellow colleagues for the for the residents so that is why with with your permission sir i have put up this one slide to give you uh, a, a very brief historical aspect of how the robotic uh, technology has evolved uh, how it has started uh, particularly in the united states so we all are aware that uh the the technology had had the greatest impact in the field of urology uh where it has been uh, most successful um and where it has been uh, you know uh, most cost effective as well uh, in terms of patient mm -hmm. outcomes um so historically uh, in 1982 um the first nerve sparing radical prostatectomy was performed this was not the robotic one but this was the first time uh, that it was performed in johns hopkins university in 1995 uh, the company the da vinci manufacturer the intuitive uh, uh, company in california was founded and one of the founders were the surgeon frederick mall accompanied by his two other colleagues in 1998 saw the first commercial sale and usage of this technology in germany uh in 2000 the fda approved uh the use of uh, robotic system for general laparoscopic surgery in the united states and globally uh in 2001 um the first uh, robotic assisted radical prostatectomy was was reported by these authors so overall when we talk about uh you know how many of these robots are out there so my estimate is is maybe over 2000 robots are working in the united states and close to you know more than 5000 or 5.5000 robots worldwide and out, out of 5500 robots worldwide uh i think over 500 are in asia uh, about 550 in asia we have robots in pakistan um in few hospitals in karachi and i heard from dr hadi khan that only one robot is functional right now in karachi at uh, siut so when we talk about this technology is relatively new um and we being uh, you know low middle income com uh, country uh, where uh, cost is going to be a big factor so uh, we are going to hear from our you know valued uh, presenter today um regarding the cost effectiveness so overall the data shows that you know although the technology gives you an edge um as you can if i can refer to the backdrop uh just for the sake of our residents sitting here and who, are, who have joined us on zoom if you look at the the platform <coughs> it is composed of three components the system works on the basis of a uh, uh, master slave concept so the slave is the uh, the robot uh, tower which has got three arms and you can load up the various instruments on these three arms like your scissors or your stapling device or your retractors or your graspers and the fourth arm uh, will uh, hold the camera and then the surgeon will operate remotely uh, you know few meters away from the actual operating table and you can see in in we have played here that the surgeon is comfortably seated on a console and has got an um, you know advantage of looking into the field through a stereoscopic you know vision a 3d stereoscopic camera which gives you 10 time magnification right sir 10 time magnification and if you compare the robotic surgeon image the surgeon is working in line with the instruments and this is opposite to our laparoscopy work that we are working 
opposite to the instruments so what the you know the people who support this technology they claim that it gives surgeon far more superior dexterity uh, precision fineness less blood loss less pain to the patient early recovery etc etc but all of this also comes with a cost so the price tag the price tag of of uh, da vinci is 2 million dollars right sir with a annual contract of maintenance of uh, a million and a half per year so that is the current you know the overall price tag and the maintenance cost and of course there is cost of the instruments and so on and so forth and dr ali is going to elaborate more on that aspect but overall i think the the technology is well established in the field of urology in terms of uh, robotic assisted radical prostatectomies and i can tell you that 86% of all urology residency programs in the united states have got robots all 42% of gynecologic oncology residency programs in the united states have got robots because they are doing these radical hysterectomies and you know other pelvic surgeries through that and uh, so the so the adoption of the technology is increasing and of course it is very difficult once you adopt the technology it is very difficult to scale back to the more affordable type of treatments so so the question today is whether these expensive technologies give you value for your money or give you any extra advantage in terms of the overall outcomes of the diseases that you treat and um, in in our setup in the developing countries how effective this model would be um, so with that i welcome dr ali khan to come here okay uh, thank you so much assalam uh, alaikum everyone and thank you so much dr malik for the uh, very warm welcome and that uh, excellent introduction to this uh, topic um before i get started i would just like to say that this is a very uh, special and somewhat nostalgic moment for me i i remember as a 6 or 7 year old kid i would run around the halls of this hospital when it was just first built in the early 1990s uh, my father was one of the first pediatricians here um you know i would go to the clinic with him i would round with him and i think the seeds for me actually becoming a physician and ultimately a surgeon were planted here so again this is a very uh, special moment for me to kind of circle back and be back here and talking to you all and it's truly a it is a uh, truly a um, uh, honor and a privilege uh, to be here talking to you all so again as uh, dr malik said i'm going to be talking about the challenges of robotic surgery and i'll also review the current state of robotic surgery um but particularly focus on the challenges in the developing world um just before i start i'd like to say i have no disclosures to report i am by no means or or not at all a sales representative for any robotic company i own no stock shares or equity in any robotic company Uh, I am simply an enthusiast for surgical technology and innovation, uh, and I myself am a practicing robotic surgeon. I trained in robotic surgery uh, during my fellowship, and I have been practicing robotic surgery for the past year. Uh, but at the same time, I also understand the limitations of robotic surgery, and those are some of the things I'd like to discuss today.
Thank you. <clears throat> so just looking over the outline of this discussion, uh, I know Dr. Malik already alluded to some of the history of robotic surgery, but I just want to briefly uh, touch up on the history of robotic surgery. I'd like to discuss the current state of robotic surgery, focusing primarily on the current evidence in the literature regarding patient outcomes. And then I'd like to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages, not only reported in the literature, but also my own anecdotal experience. I'd like to then move on and discuss some of the challenges in developing world. And a lot of this, as you can discuss, and again, Dr. Malik alluded to, will have to do with cost of robotic surgery and how that can become a big barrier to implementing and establishing a program. And then lastly, I'd like to discuss some of the strategies that uh, hospitals and institutions in the developing world could apply uh, if they are truly interested in uh, establishing uh, and sustaining a robotic program. So looking back um, in history, a prototype for endoscope actually dates back to the ancient Roman periods well over 2000 years ago. Um, this was discovered in the ruins of Pompeii uh, in the early Roman Empire. Uh, but moving uh, fast forwarding about 1800 years or so, uh, Philip Bonzini, a German physician, was the first to create a light guided instrument and he called it the lift lighter. Uh, used it primarily for examining uh, the urinary tract and uh, the rectum and the pharynx. Antoine Desmarou uh, developed the endoscope in 1853, and again, this is primarily focused on uh, examining the urinary tract, the rectum, and the pharynx. And then over the past um, about 30 years, I guess, uh, broadly speaking, the last quarter of the 20th century, there was a dramatic reduction in surgical invasiveness and in the development of the field of minimally invasive surgery. And a lot of these um, uh, techniques and applications actually developed uh, within endourology and endogynecology those skills were transferred over to gastrointestinal endoscopy and laparoscopy. And subsequently, the development of robotic surgery was essentially just a continuation of those um, uh, surgical techniques and those new innovations developed, uh, bringing on what I would like to call, or other people would also call, the second generation laparoscopic surgery. Robotic surgery is not different than laparoscopic surgery. I think it's just the new generation of laparoscopic surgery. So in 1994, just looking more focusing on the history primarily of robotic surgery, the automated endoscopic system for optimal positioning called the uh, ASOP machine was approved uh, by the United States Food and Drug Administration. This was essentially a robotic arm uh, used for holding the endoscope. It was voice controlled with adjustable positioning to ensure steady view of the operating field during uh, endoscopic surgery. Uh, a couple of years later, the Zeus robotic system was developed with three robotic arms. Um, and subsequently, as Dr. Malik uh, mentioned, the intuitive da Vinci system was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States in 2000. And then moving on from this a year later, um, Quite impressively, the Lindenberg or Lindbergh transatlantic telesurgery uh, operation uh, was performed. Uh, this was performed by a French uh, surgeon um, <clears throat> by the name of Joaquin Mars Marsox, um, and he was in New York performing a robotic cholecystectomy in a patient in Strasbourg, France. And then lastly, um, the Da Vinci XI robotic platform was released in 2014. Um, this is a platform uh, that has, uh, I think, I believe about 5,000 uh, robotic platforms worldwide, 2,000 of which being in the United States, the rest being uh, in Western Europe, uh, parts of China, South Korea, Japan. Um, and this company, this platform essentially at this time has more or less a monopoly uh, on the robotics uh, market. I'll talk about that a little bit further towards the end of the talk. Um, but they are primarily the leaders in the field, although there are new companies coming up. But right now, most robotic surgeries are being performed using this, either this platform or the older version, the SI Da Vinci platform. So moving on to the current state of robotic surgery, this is a, um, a very good article out of the New York Times. I believe it was published in 
uh, August of uh, 2020, looking at our robotic surgeries really better. I encourage all of you, if you have access to, to read this article, but the conclusion of this was basically stated in the line below that robotic surgeries have only a modest advantage uh, over uh, other conventional laparoscopic or open approaches. Um, but I'd like to kind of dig into this a little bit deeper. I've reviewed some of the patient outcomes and the evidence in the literature. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the advantages that have been reported in the literature and some of my own anecdotal experience uh, in addition to the disadvantages. So this is the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine article that was actually presented or discussed in the New York Times article that I just spoke about. This is by uh, first author, Dr. Anela Danani, uh, and it's a review of 50 randomized controlled trials looking at a wide range of surgeries performed either robotically or laparoscopically going from uro urologic procedures, gynecologic procedures, thoracic, and general surgery, surgical oncology procedures. And in the majority of these uh, studies, they showed no difference in intraoperative complications, uh, in conversion rates to open surgery in patients undergoing laparoscopic versus robotic surgery, or in long-term outcomes. The robotic surgery had significantly longer operative times compared to laparoscopic surgery, uh, but otherwise no significant uh, benefits were demonstrated um, comparing robotic surgery to laparoscopic surgery. Uh, Dr. Danani was quoted uh, in that New York Times article saying, just because something is new and fancy doesn't mean it's a better technique. Yes, robotics is safe. We've proven that, but we haven't proven it's better. There were four studies that showed a benefit with robotic surgery, so that's quite modest. 46 showed no difference at all. There's another meta-analysis looking at clinical outcomes of robotic surgery compared to conventional surgical approaches. Um, this was a review of 333 studies and 18 randomized control trials looking at radical prostatectomies, hysterectomies, pulmonary lobectomies, thymectomies, rectal cancer resections, partial nephrectomies, distal gastrectomies, and y gastric bypasses, liver resections, distal pancreatectomies, and cholecystectomies. So quite an extensive review. And um, with the study that found that robotic prostatectomy, as Dr. Mullick had uh, uh, discussed earlier, that within the field of urology is the one that we've been able to see the most benefits so far. Uh, and with robotic prostatectomies, there was an evidence of lower biochemical recurrence, improved recovery and pain score compared to open approaches only, and improved urinary and sexual function compared to laparoscopic uh, approaches only. And then there was also some benefit seen with robotic hysterectomies performed for endometrial cancer, where there's fewer conversions to open uh, compared to laparoscopic uh, procedures, but otherwise robotic outcomes were similar to conventional approaches. Reviewing slightly or going digging into the oncologic outcomes related with robotic surgery, this is the editorial piece out of uh, JAMA Oncology last year or two years ago. Uh, and again, they uh, discussed that there really was no significant difference in patients um, in terms of their overall survival, disease-free survival, uh, distant local recurrence. Uh, this is a retrospective analysis uh, looking at patients with mid to low rectal cancer uh, undergoing preoperative chemo radiation followed by surgery. Uh, they had about 118 patients in the robotic arm, 415 patients in the laparoscopic arm, and really similar long-term outcomes of five-year uh, disease-free survival, distant and local recurrence rates. Uh, similar article by looking at gastric cancer uh, patients uh, another retrospective analysis, uh, there was about 313 patients uh, undergoing robotic gastrectomy versus 524 undergoing laparoscopic gastrectomy. Again, no statistically significant difference in five-year overall or disease-free survival. Again, uh, at this point, don't want to uh, sound too much like a broken record, um, but uh, this is another review. Uh, kind of similar setup retrospective analysis for looking at patients undergoing surgery for endometrial cancer. They saw no difference in intra or post operative complications, no difference in lymph node retrieval, no difference in hospital stay between robotic uh, versus laparoscopic approaches, and no difference in disease free and overall survival. So moving forward, um, looking after reviewing some of those patient outcomes, what are truly the 
the benefits of robotic surgery if outcomes seem to be so similar across the board. Um, you know, being the, the technology does allow, um, again, much higher magnification, much better visualization, uh, 3D visualization. And with the robotic platform, the ability to have articulation of the wrist, basically having hands within the abdomen uh, or within the thorax uh, with wrist articulation and seven degree range of motion um, really provides a tremendous amount of increased dexterity, um, increased manipulation and increased precision of, uh, of tissues. Uh, and uh, moreover, also the overall surgeon uh, comfort and ergonomics. And then instead of standing at the patient's bedside, training your neck, training your back, I'm sure a lot of you have been through a difficult laparoscopic polycystectomy where you know, I place all my weight on my left leg. I, I even now have started to have some knee pain after performing some difficult operations. Um, that really is proven to be significantly better on the surgeon. Uh, on the surgeon's uh, neck, back, uh, overall muscle strain. So I want to talk about that a little bit uh, further. Um, in terms of the ability to perform complex, uh, minimally invasive operations, this is a, a review uh, out of the um, uh, Journal of Thoracic Surgery. Uh, and they found that adoption of robotic surgery has increased at a much faster rate uh, for esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, and colorectal resections compared to laparoscopic techniques that were being implemented about one to two decades ago. And again, they attribute that to the improved range of motion, the uh, increased dexterity, and the overall increased magnification and 3D visualization. Here's another study reviewing a robotic training uh, program for, for performing robotic whipples. Um, they looked at 40 patients undergoing robotic whipples and had a very impressive mean operative time of six hours, mean blood loss of 300 cc's, um, length of stay in the hospital of about seven days, 7.5% uh, conversion to open rate and, and similar rates of post-operative pancreatic fistula to other uh, laparoscopic or open approaches. And again, if you, if you look at the literature for surgeon comfort and ergonomics, you're gonna find hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of papers on this. Uh, here's a systematic review, again, highlighting the true benefit of robotic surgery, at least at this point in time, as being surgeon ergonomics. You know, they, I did surveys of multiple surgeons that performed surgeries on over 3,074 patients, and all um, of the results of these surveys um, demonstrated that robotics conferred superior ergonomic benefits, reduced, low, reduced workload, and lower self-reported discomfort. Uh, for the surgeons. Here's another study that was performed uh, where four gynecologic oncology surgeons who were experienced in both laparoscopic and robotic surgery um, uh, performed uh, three simulated uh, exercises, either laparoscopically or robotically. It was one of those wheel in the peg suturing techniques um, that are uh, frequently we learn through fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. And at the same time, they were measuring uh, surgeon muscle and movement through uh, electronic sensors, and they found that robotic surgery required much less surgeon movement, uh, a much lower degree of muscle activity uh, compared to laparoscopic uh, surgery. Disadvantages, um, those again have been discussed before, and uh, Dr. Mullick alluded to cost is a major, major disadvantage. I'll review that a little bit further. Uh, but also operative time, you know, the time that it takes to dock the robot and undock the robot, especially when you're starting out to learn robotic surgery and implement a robotic surgery program. Um, it can be quite cumbersome. It can uh, take at least 15 to 20 minutes to dock and undock the robot, even if you're very, very efficient. Uh, if there's some inefficiency there, it can take up to half an hour. Uh, but also a lack of haptic feedback. You know, surgeons, we work with our hands. We like to touch tissue. We like to manipulate tissue, feel, uh, feel pulsations. Uh, so there's some degree of that being lost. But I think that can also be overcome by the improved visualization and being able to see the um, uh, change in the tissue of the color, the profusion of the uh, uh, tissues 
as you manipulate the tissues or suture the tissues, that can kind of make up for some of the lost haptic feedback, but probably not all of it. So again, just want to highlight this. Um, this is a, a study looking at some of the uh, you know, optimized outcomes for um, colorectal cancer surgery with robotic platforms. Again, one of the biggest things that they note longer operative time and higher costs. Again, similar story, initial experiences with robotic single strike thoracic surgery. Robotic surgery shows longer operative time and higher costs. So just to summarize, where are we right now? What's the current state of robotic surgery? Again, there are some modest benefits uh, being demonstrated compared to laparoscopic surgery. They're not drastically improved uh, outcomes, but there are some outcomes. And I think uh, over time, these outcomes will improve even more. There will be um, some better outcomes in relation to pain control, uh, patient uh, ambulation and mobility following surgery, uh, and also hospital stays. But at this time, these benefits have shown to be quite modest. The clear advantages that have been demonstrated are in surgery and ergonomics and comfort, but also I believe there is a much higher degree of feasibility for performing complex minimally invasive operations uh, compared to laparoscopic surgery. I think I myself am much more likely to do a low anterior resection or a gastrectomy with D2 lymphadenectomy robotically versus laparoscopically. I don't think I personally would want to take on that challenge. I don't think I'm at the point where I want to do any robotic whipples, uh, but that's just a preference. I don't, I don't think I have the uh, patience to, to do that uh, procedure for whatever, 12, 16 hours. Disadvantages, again, like I, I discussed earlier, increased operative time and costs are uh, the two big ones. So again, a lot of this literature that I've discussed with you, this um, comes, most of it, a majority of it comes from North America, um, Western Europe, uh, parts of uh, Asia, including South Korea, Japan, and China. But you can see that the number of publications about robotic surgery has skyrocketed. And this chart only goes to about 2015. I think if you extrapolate out another seven years, it continues to go up. But where are these publications coming from? And what are the implications of that for the developing world? As you can see, these are coming from North America, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, and parts of China, some in the Middle East and India and Australia, but most of these are centered on the industrial world. So what does that mean? And, and what are the challenges um, of implementing and instituting robotics uh, in the developing world? Uh, this is uh, Dr. or Professor Pokar Dasupta. Um, this is at the European Association of Urology meeting in 2018. Again, his take on this is trying to become a better surgeon, particularly if you are in the developing world, stop obsessing about technology. There are no difference in outcomes. Only 5% of operations are robotic. The cost of robotic assisted procedures rose by 13% in three years, resulting in about $2.5 billion in additional healthcare costs. And robotic surgery is an unnecessary luxury in the developing world. This is an example of, of uh, you know, where uh, it can be quite difficult sometimes to implement a robotic surgery program. This was uh, a hospital in Buenos Aires in Argentina where the first robotic platform was purchased, but it was actually purchased by a bank loan paid by the surgeon's personal salary. And once the surgeon was able to demonstrate um, financial sustainability, and then the hospital took full responsibility of loan repayments. Similar or uh, analogous story, also in Argentina at Federico uh, Abede Hospital, they acquired two robotic systems in 2009, but due to their ability to demonstrate a lack of, uh, or have a lack of uh, financial sustainability and low amount of economic resources, this program was actually interrupted three years in 
uh, and was not uh, reinstituted or restarted back up just because of the financial and economic constraints of running this program. Um, another uh, article, this is out of uh, uh, New Delhi in India at the uh, Max Hospital uh, Department of Urology. Um, they looked at literature examining outcomes of laparoscopic versus robotic surgery for prostatectomies, nephrectomies, cystectomies, retroperitoneal, and inguinal lymph node dissection, and saw that there were similar outcomes but significantly increased cost of robotic surgery. And they concluded that the cost of robotic system is prohibitively high to support its widespread application. And I think that's the key thing to focus on. Widespread application across the country is much, much different than selective application in certain centers that actually are able to sustain it. So I don't want to, uh, at this point, give the, uh, give the impression that I'm trying to say that robotic surgery is worthless, but I'm saying at this point in time, the widespread application in, in every hospital at the level that's being performed in, in the United States and Western Europe, that uh, is not quite feasible yet, but we'll carry on. I'll discuss that for a little more. So what is the cost uh, of these platforms? And um, so if you look at the Da Vinci SI surgical system, that's actually the older system. Uh, and at the time it, it came out, it was $2.6 million. I think, I believe at this point, it is $2 million for the XI robotic system. Um, the reusable equipment in, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a, a shelf life of all these. There is a, can you come up? There's a shelf life on these um, uh, equipments where they can have a use of about 10 to 20, 10 to 20 times, uh, whether that's the scissors, that's the dissectors, that's the retractor instruments, staplers or vessel sealers. Um, so there is a cost of the reusable equipment as well, which is almost about 10% of the cost of acquiring the platform itself. Uh, again, additional costs per procedure. The cost of training each surgeon is about $6,000, and that's not taking into account the cost of training your surgical staff, uh, your first assist, your uh, surgical scrub techs, uh, your circulating nurses that assist you with uh, docking the robot and undocking the robot. Uh, and then lastly, there's an annual maintenance fee of about close to 10% as well. Some of these costs, I'm sure, are changing as time goes on. Uh, but overall, this is a, a rough estimate of what the cost uh, annually uh, for having a uh, robotics platform and for uh, acquiring a robotics platform. So in summary, you know, there's drastically high costs related to the robotic platform with, at this time, little to modest benefit and outcomes. There, um, you know, given this, I would say it's difficult to justify widespread application of robotic surgery in resource-limited countries. So what are some strategies for institutions um, in developing countries? How do you address this? This is a new technology that is showing um, some benefit, although that benefit at this time is modest. Um, what is what is what is its feasibility here? Uh, what is its application here? And what kind of institutions are uh, actually able to start a program and establish a program? I think the first and foremost thing for any institution thinking about this is that they really have to have a um, in-depth look uh, and a, a soul-searching period of what are their ultimate goals? Do they want to be on the leading front? Do they want to be um, you know, on the leading edge of surgical technology and innovation? Um, obviously, a rural hospital uh, somewhere uh, with lack of resources, um, that probably would not be a priority for, um, you know, uh, but hospitals in, in bigger cities in developing countries, such as Islam, Badrachi, Lahore, uh, other countries, uh, you know, um, those may have the opportunities to be at the leading edge. I mean, at, at a place like Shafab, 
things like liver transplant are being performed just today. I find out HIPEC is being performed. You guys, this institution is the leading edge for Pakistan, this Al Khan, other institutions. So it really comes down to what are the goals of that institution and how much is a priority for that institution to be at that leading edge. And I think some of the things that can assist with that are obviously, and again, I by no means know the, the public or the political or the government side of things, but having public and government support um, you know, is, a, is a key factor and it has been demonstrated to be a key factor in the Western countries, in um, uh, Western Europe, where a lot of medicine is socialized. Um, and also I'll, I'll show an example of, um, of this public government support that has shown some feasibility in Pakistan as well on the next slide. Next thing is there needs to be a deep assessment of financial stability, uh, sustainability. You know, what type of patients are you seeing? Are these patients um, low income, mid income, high income? What is their affordability uh, enabled? And are they able to pay for these surgeries? Are they in interested in having these surgeries? Next, I think a very important thing, once you do make the decision that um, you want to obtain a robotics platform is there has to be multi-department and multi-surgical specialty buy-in. This is not a program that just one department alone, whether that's general surgery or urology or gynecology can sustain on its own. It has to have buy-in from, from all departments that uh, this application can be um, uh, geared towards. Um, it can't be done alone by just one department mm -hmm. because that essentially buys it. So the benefits and potential losses um, of instituting the program are shared, distributed uh, within multiple departments. Marketing incentives can be quite powerful, just being able to market that you are the only institution in the area performing body surgery will, uh, has the potential of attracting uh, a lot of new patients, um, you know, putting, putting your hospital, putting your institution on the map um, as being on the leading edge. And then lastly, I think taking into account that as any technology develops further and further, the cost of that technology goes down. More businesses uh, and startups and companies come up that produce um, either better equipment or uh, non-inferior equipment with decreased costs uh, and bring more competition into the market. So I think even if if you're not planning on buying a robotic platform, having that piece of information in your mind and being aware of what's out there and what's coming up is a very important um, factor. So again, this is uh, a study um, done uh, out of uh, Karachi, a single government uh, hospital and civil hospital in Karachi. They were the first to install the Da Vinci system in 2011 and 2013. The total cost at that time was around 320 million rupees with a 10% annual maintenance cost. And the average cost of robotic procedures was around um, $389,000. Now, the financial impact of this robotic system, you know, is um, somewhat justified um, by the return of investment, um, which decreased hospital stay, they, they mentioned it as they saw some decrease in hospital stay, but the um, return from those decreased hospital stays um, was quite modest. But they also noted that this model cannot be applied to um, all setups because their setup was under a state welfare hospital, which uh, really uh, the treatment was free of cost. So therefore all the financial burden uh, of <clears throat> the uh, institution of the robotic, sorry. The financial burden was not necessarily on the hospital, it was on the state. So whatever, you know, the, my point being with presenting this is there is, uh, you know, a high cost of this, but having government support, state support, welfare support uh, can be a big role, uh, can play a big role in instituting and sustaining these programs. Um, you know, it's difficult to say how much political leverage or political capital uh, any given hospital has had, has, but if there is any, I think, you know, it's important to try and utilize that 
to try and uh, optimize the um, opportunity to sustain that program. And again, like I mentioned earlier, there needs to be a thorough assessment of financial uh, sustainability, whether that's uh, support through government or state welfare institutions, a reimbursement for health insurance companies, uh, and also having a very deep review of your patient population. What is their average income and economic class? Are they able to afford um, this increased cost of procedures? Uh, you know, looking back at uh, the study from Karachi, their average cost was about uh, almost uh, $400,000 for uh, an average robotic procedure. Um, you know, I was talking to Dr. Malik this morning and he was saying the average cost for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy is about 150,000 rupees. So comparing 150,000 rupees to 400,000 rupees, is that justifiable? Would your patients be interested in it based on their affordability? Uh, I think there needs to be a very deep review of that. And then lastly, there needs to be a, an analysis of how many number of cases you need to perform in order to make it financially uh, sustainable. Um, you know, if, if uh, you purchase a robotic system for nearly $2 million and it's only used once a month, uh, it's obviously not going to be feasible. It's not going to um, be able to sustain the program. Uh, and in most of the literature that I came across, it said about 100 to 150 cases um, was kind of the sweet spot for being able to uh, justify and cover the cost. Now, I understand that may be different uh, depending on where you are, what country you are, what the resources of those institutions are, but just as a general number, uh, I, I found that as a rough estimate. So again, um, multi-department initiative. Uh, again, this requires buy-in from multiple surgical departments. No one department alone uh, is enough to sustain a program. Uh, you need buy-in from general surgery, urology, uh, ENT, gynecology, thoracic surgery, surgical oncology departments. And I think as you see the technology develop, even more and more surgical specialties uh, will be involved and they will find some applicability of the robotic platform uh, for their patients. Lastly, marketing, um, just to go over the global surgical market generated around $5.6 billion in 2020. This is expected to reach around $17 billion in 2030. So it's very important to have a successful advertising and outreach uh, campaign uh, that can potentially attract a, a higher volume of patients and actually make your program even busier. Um, uh, if you're able to attract those patients that are desiring a more precise and less invasive surgery. And also establishing the robotic pro uh, program really creates wide opportunities for leadership of your surgical program, of your um, institution in the area, in the country, in the region, um, the ability to uh, create training programs for other hospitals, um, you know, it's difficult to say when robotic surgery will be prime time for widespread application in developing countries. It certainly is in the industrial world, but it's difficult to say when that will come uh, in, in the developing world, but it will come. It's just like laparoscopy. It's like laparoscopy was in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, another thing is if you look as early back, That's obviously not the case anymore. I imagine every OR in the world now, with the exception of a few, have air conditioning. So over time, a lot can change in 20, 30, 40 years. And having a program at this time will prepare that institution to play a key leadership role when robotic surgery inevitably becomes widespread, even in the developing world. It also creates uh, opportunities for multinational collaboration. It creates opportunities for this. I basically, I just want to touch upon this a little bit to, to keep in mind. Um, this is a, a graph uh, representing Moore's law and Moore's law basically states, uh, Gordon Moore was a, um, a, a tech uh, engineer, computer science engineer. And his perception was that, you know, looking at transistors on microchips, for development of um, you know faster and supercomputers, you know his 
view was that as time goes on, as the technology develops, the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. So every two years, computers are becoming twice as fast, twice as strong. Um, their computing power is doubling nearly every two years. But the cost of those computers at the same time is being cut by half. It has now become widespread in all um, hospitals across Pakistan, across even most of the developing world. Uh, I think robotic surgery will follow a similar trend. And even if this is not something that um, institutions are interested in now, being aware of it, being aware of the technology that is out there, um, being cognizant of the fact that the cost of this technology will decrease uh, can be quite powerful when that time comes uh, to be ready and be um, ready to institute that program um, and jump on the gun uh, so you're not late on it and you're still kind of the leading front uh, uh, of the, the application. Thank you very much. I'll, I can uh, take any questions or discussion at this point. Uh, my name is Pranav uh, and uh, I, having done robotic surgery, this is the degree that from uh, I agree with what you were saying that you know once you've done a low interior section on a robotic platform, you don't want to clap it so quickly. It's ergonomically so special. Mm -hmm. I just wanted your view on the fact about, uh, as you mentioned, it needs to be a subspecialty program. Everyone needs to get involved in this to make it financially viable. Uh, we're doing colorectal robotics, uh, HGB are doing their, uh, and every, everyone is doing it. But that is not this applies mm -hmm. into, into certain specific fields, which you would agree that is the norm in the Western, especially if you're going to the center. Yeah. You would see colorectal surgeons only doing colorectal cancer, and similarly, other guys are going to other GI. So, how do you address that aspect, considering that if you want to bring it in Shikar, that doesn't exist? Mm. I, think, I think that's a very, very good question. Um, I think the the main thing is having if you have the buy-in across the work across the board, there's many procedures uh, that they can be uh, e even as a general surgeon. Like I I I am trained in general surgery, I'm trained in surgical oncology, but I don't do only whipples. You know, I do only breasts, I do only I do breasts, I do endocrine, I do uh, colorectal, I do pancreas, I do liver, gastric, and I also do general surgery. So I have found that for me, having that broader practice actually helps my training. So I suppose like if, if I was doing my first, let's say my first robotic case as an attendant or as a consultant, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing a gastrectomy or I wouldn't be doing a, a whipple or I wouldn't be doing a, a complex, you know, locally advanced, low interior section. I started off with lap coli. I started off with lap ventral hernia repairs and I did lap inguinal hernia repairs. Once I got about 10 or 20 of those done, then I started doing lap, laparoscopic right hemicolectomies. Once I got one or two of those done, then I did a laparoscopic low interior section. And then now moving forward, my goal is to try and do a, a distal pancreatectomy or a distal gastrectomy. Um, and then maybe down the line, I, I do something more complex, like a, a robot or a section or something like that. I think, you know, that could play into an advantage if you have surgeons uh, who have broad sets of practices. It will actually, in my opinion, assist their ability or improve their ability to get trained because they don't have to jump right to the most complex operation that they do. They can start off with the easier stuff. They can start off with, um, you know, the lap laparoscopic polycystectomy, the lapping, or the, I'm sorry, the robotic polycystectomy, the hernia repairs, repair, ventral hernias. Um, you know, so that that would be my uh, I think don't don't view that as a disadvantage, even though um, validation can be good uh, in some cases. 
I think there are advantages to having broad sets of practices because it can help you apply um, the robotic platform on a broad range and build up and get to the point where you're doing more and more complex operations. But that would be my take on that. And I'm doing a bit of a erratic work here. The thing is, uh, if you can guide us, if somebody is doing a uh, routine level of work, how long is it going to take him or her? The training needs to be a few months, a few weeks, or what? Um, we just have a few other questions. That sure. You can so I, I think in regards to the training, if you are a skilled laparoscopic surgeon, it will take you a much shorter to develop those same skills on a robot, just because of the improvement in range of motion and dexterity and the less strain on, on the surgeon himself or herself. The ability to learn curve for the right platform is much less steeper than the learning curve for laparoscopic. I, I trained at a very robust, uh, under a very robust laparoscopic surgeon, Dr. Malik knows, Dr. Mellinger himself. We happen to train under the same program director uh, or chair. Um, so I had excellent laparoscopic, but I still don't, I never felt, and then I went to fellowship I got additional training in robotic surgery. I never felt coming out of residence. So comfort. I just couldn't. Laparoscopic right colectomies were okay, but sigmoidectomies um, and low anterior sections, particularly low rectal tumors, I found very difficult to perform laparoscopically. And, and I, I didn't even try to institute that um, in my I practice I to do a laparoscopic volunteer section. I went directly to robotic because I felt my conversion rate to open would be unacceptably high. I think if, if you are already a good uh, or a very skilled laparoscopic surgeon, which I'm sure you are with doing uh, bariatric surgery, I think your ability to develop um, skills on the robotic platform will come at a much faster rate. Typically, you want to, again, start off with the easier procedures. And I think if you get 10 to 20 easier procedures like lapis, uh, robotic polycystectomies, inguinal hernia, and mental hernia repairs, you can then build up and you will see already that you will be able to perform. It, I don't think it will take three months. It would be a training program where you would have to do a course, learn the program, learn how to use the robotics uh, platform, how to dock, how to undock. And then from there, about 20 cases is what I would say until you start getting the feel of it. And then 50 cases, you will be proficient. And if you can do 50 cases, it depends on how busy you are. Obviously, if you can do 50 cases in two or three months, then, then that's what I'm guessing it would take. Now, the other thing is about the cost of the uh, reach. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, uh, financially, I don't think it would be sustainable. But I thought there are newer, cheaper versions yeah. uh, coming into the market. Mm -hmm. Now, Shifa, I tell you something uh, is ready to take on any of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we started with liver transplant, mm -hmm. which nobody or no institution in Pakistan exactly. ever dared to start because of there is a failure. And in fact, But they started at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. But that uh, ended up with a uh, disaster. Mm -hmm. They stopped it immediately. Shifa, Alhamdulillah, still take is doing very well last time. Not only liver, but kidney and bone marrow and all. Um, I think that I do want to, uh, to uh, purchase the equipment. But I don't know what type of equipment that going to purchase. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Uh, Arif Malik is, uh, is quite familiar with these mm -hmm. uh, uh, different uh, types of robots which are in the market are coming. Mm -hmm. We in the developing world are particularly used to Chinese version of things, sure. which are relatively cheaper 
Um, I don't know quality wise how good they are. We will be starting, but the, the, we have other problems. Like you need to have a about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if we can attract patients from the Middle East, from the science based US in the UK, uh, uh, but we never worked on that matter. The mind trying about this, but I'm very to come up with something like that. And that then would make it uh, actually uh, quite because our problem is that uh, you mentioned about the lab code 150, it's not 150, it's 160, 170,000. Sure. But, uh, and believe me, with these fish, one of the refers are like you refer to patients. They go back because of the financial mm -hmm. They want to buy in, and unfortunately, it will be so much no room for bargaining. So, uh, so that that's the uh, It's in it's our future. In our generation, we have laparoscopy, and now it's the robot, mm -hmm. and it has to come. So, it, so yes, I think the article started a bit early. Uh, yeah. So if you can guide us about the training courses we'd be in touch with you, many of us who haven't even uh, uh, set on the, uh, the control so far, Sure. Uh, talking and talking and uh, different courses that would be great. And then I think uh, Shifa is going to start it today or tomorrow. They are. Sure. But I think for the first time, he um, told me about that, yes, that we should have a robot. But I think now the administration is seriously yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, um, and I could leave you, I think, um, you know, being aware, and again, I, other than the GXI, I personally can't uh, speak to how good they are, or they're, uh, are they, you know, better or non inferior or, or inferior products. Uh, but I think having awareness of that, having the use of new, uh, technology and new products coming out and new companies that are developing uh, the robot is very, very important. If, you know, uh, purchasing the Da Vinci is not something that's feasible uh, for your institution. Um, I, th I think that's very critical. And I, th I think time will declare things, you know, uh, very, um, the, the long time these technologies, these new platforms will come out. They will be study form. They will be little to the Da Vinci robot outcomes, compared to, compared to open outcomes. And I think that will really provide you uh, excellent guidance on, on what product to go with. Um, and I, I think, you know, uh, nobody would argue that what China accomplished, you know, in the past 20 years, uh, it's nothing short of exceptional. So I think there will be the technologies. In terms of robotic surgery, that will follow suit. I completely agree with you. Thank you, Ali. I'm talking to Rishan, but there's such an interesting opportunity in the university. Firstly, Extremely grateful for a second overview on the public stage to provide it for the session and she has nothing to have. Seeing and working again that the public safety experience was in the eye unit where we had a limited use of it in terms of handled cardio, myopy, smoking, gastric snakers, and robotic resistance of stage mobilization. My question or my thoughts on it is as the last six have mentioned that as a GI or the therapeutic junior talk which came around in our minds at that time is 
like Laplace of the 2015, I remember publishing a paper where 15% of all the second work in all of the UK was done laparoscopically in talking about cancer work. And there was a lot of criticism about long term morbidity related to it. The other five years for the students to realize, no, this is the way forward. And now the spectrum is completely changed. And if you don't do it laparoscopically, they look at you when there are eyes. So how, how do you, uh, in your personal experience, feel about the GI surgery in terms you mentioned about gastrectomy? Where else do you see the utilization for the per unit, which obviously will have people who have limited experience with robotic surgery, plus there will be some who have used robot, but there are some who haven't used robot beforehand. So what will be your thoughts on it? And then I'll have another question also. Yeah, I, I think the, the the biggest application in my mind right now for upper GI would be particularly towards the complex minimally invasive operations. I think, you know, I, uh, in my training in residency, I'll give you an example. Uh, the thoracic department was doing most of the esophagectomy and they were doing some of them. They tried to do them laparoscopic, but they were not having the best outcomes. They had uh, unacceptably high uh, leak rates. And I think that application, I think being able to, and it's also, you know, a, a tough operation to do. Not that I do uh, a lot of thoracic surgery. I'm, I'm primarily based in the abdomen. I don't particularly do a lot of esophageal cancer. I think applying a minimally invasive approach laparoscopically to esophageal cancer or gastric cancer is much, much difficult compared to robotic surgery. I think being able to, if, if you're, for example, doing a D2 lymphadenectomy and you're dissecting lymph nodes off uh, you know, the hepatic and the celiac axis and, and uh, you know, the periportal or uh, perigastric nodes, that is quite challenging with laparoscopically, at least for me. And I, I speak that out of personal experience. I know there's laparoscopic surgeons out there that are very, very skilled uh, and they can perform the procedures laparoscopically. But I think even for a um, a, you know, above average laparoscopic surgeon performing a, uh, a esophagectomy through a, a hybrid laparoscopic and VATS approach is quite difficult. I think the same thing for a gastrectomy for cancer. I think a distal gastrectomy is arguably uh, definitely much more easier to do laparoscopically, but doing a total gastrectomy or a near total gastrectomy uh, with a lymphadenectomy is quite difficult uh, laparoscopically. So I think, you know, in terms of upper GI surgery, that's not you're starting the program. You're not going to jump to just the first surgery you do is a robotic esophagy or a robotic gastrectomy. I, obviously, um, you know, I, that's not advisable. But I think that would be the ultimate goal. I think that would be the... Uh, the goal to shoot for and um, the vision to have that like we're instituting this program. It's going to take us some time. It might take a year. It might take two years to have buy-in across the departments, have multiple people performing robotic surgeries. Each in each department have a pathway laid out. So you know, uh, for example, you. I'm, I'm guessing you're doing you're doing a lot of general surgery. So. Uh, you know, I could see an outline for you being something like the first two, three months, you're doing gallbladders, hernias, inguinal hernias, ventral hernias, moving on to uh, maybe some more easier cases like distal gastrectomies, or uh, if you're doing uh, bariatric surgery, a sleeve gastrectomy is a great way to start off with. If that's something you're doing uh, for bariatric, then, you know, institute it for a, a real and wide gastric bypass. And then, you know, within a couple of months, try to do maybe a distal gastrectomy. Again, obviously, you can't time all of this. Patients come in and, and you have to evaluate them. You have to select them. You have to make sure that they're, they're the right candidate. I think over a one to two year period, you could develop your skills from simple cases and then move that up all the way up to complex cases such as gastrectomies and esophagectomies for uh, cancer patients. I think the other aspect of it, especially while Shafa is looking into uh, having the robot, is 
As far as I remember, in uh, the channel assert that we are using the robot on a Monday and then same paper was being used by the urologist on Tuesday. And likewise, the gynecologist would come in or a colorectal surgeon would come in. Um, especially while the hospital physician is looking into it, this is one of the important logistic aspects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it work at your unit? Uh, does the theatre remain the same different specialties come in so that you don't need to move the whole equipment out because that was the biggest hurdle when we were there because they were trying to use it in two theatres. The time taken to move stuff and train the staff was also an issue. Yeah, Is there any pattern you use so that we could think so, about it yeah, before? Yeah. In ours, there's two robotic XI platforms. Um, in other institutions that I trained, there was, in where I did fellowship, there was four robotic platforms. Uh, and where I did residency, there was four or five robotic platforms. But basically, the, the, the robot stayed in the room that it was set up in. There was no moving the robot in and out of the room. But there was block time assigned to different surgeons, uh, depending on the day. And it was even divided based on morning and afternoon. Sunday morning may be general surgery, Monday afternoon may be colorectal, or the full day for Monday may be general surgery, Tuesday urology, Wednesday's uh, uh, gynecology, Thursday is thoracic surgery. So it's all, it was all divided based on block time. Um, and, um, you know, but there was no, uh, the multiple specialties, you know, in separate, uh, with the exception of uh, the cardiac ORs, they had their separate ORs. They were doing, uh, you know, my programs that I was at, they weren't doing any robotic cardiac. There's one OR space, one main OR space with multiple OR and the robotic platform stayed uh, within the ORs, there wasn't a need to move them in and out. Thank you. My name is Dr. Shadi Fakhar. I'm a gynecologist. Thank you very much for the inviting all the challenges. I think this, is, uh, whatever the challenges you have already told about the cost, the cost effectiveness. Uh, the biggest the maintenance of the robot. Absolutely. Because, and especially in a country like Pakistan, as we see that there are so many problems because the person has to fly from at some port mm -hmm. where he has been deported. Mm -hmm. And then he come overnight or the day and it took a long time and then they do the maintenance of that robot. Because then the of the robotics. Yeah. And uh, there, uh, the, uh, a day before uh, to do a surgery on the um, in the original theater in the patient or over the patient, the robot has some problem in its uh, in its arm, mm -hmm. yeah. and then the person he fly to the bank, came overnight, reached at two a.m. and he fixed the robot by nine a.m. Mm -hmm. and then we are the surgery. Yeah. So. In that prospect, what do you see? What will be the situation and how they can facilitate us? I want to answer the question regarding the shift of the learning curve. Mm -hmm. has already been trained and doing all the laparoscopic surgery. I think if it is just the adjustment of your exactly. mode, nothing else. Exactly. So if you, you are used to it and you are doing it and you are practicing it, it will not take more than two weeks. Exactly. Yep. Not more than two weeks mm -hmm. to get accustomed to all those movements. Yeah. And um, another thing is, I did note that um, one of my um, senior, uh, my mentor who has taught me all these um, skills, uh, he mentioned that uh, one of the patients, I think I experienced the same thing in Pakistan. He come and he did on the surgery and when he was doing the payment, he said that, why should I pay to you? <laughs> then all the surgery, why should I pay to you? Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. No, I, I absolutely agree with you uh, in regards to the point of transitioning from being a skilled laparoscopic surgeon to a skilled robotic surgeon. I think it is just, it's, it's a very natural transition. 
it's, it's, it's the same, um, if not much better visualization, uh, 3D visualization. And then once, once you sit on there and it's just so intuitive, uh, yeah. Uh, and I think that transition, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, for some people, it'll take one or two weeks. Some people, it may take a little bit longer, but I think that will be more so in just learning the controls. I, it's not going to be once the controls, once you get an idea of the controls and how to get the buttons and it becomes second here, the way left. That happens very, very fast. Um, in regards to, um, and I'm sorry, the initial maintenance, yes. In terms of maintenance, I, I, I absolutely agree with you there too. It's, it's a very difficult issue to account for when you have this very sophisticated technology that's made in um, you know, a completely different part of the world where you have numerous engineers and sales representatives that, you know, me personally, I, I, you know, while I was doing my robotic surgery, the first initial ones, I would have a, um, a representative from the company there at all times. So if there's any sort of malfunction, he could troubleshoot it. He could uh, try to, you know, uh, fix it, alleviate it so we can move forward with the surgery. Um, I think that is is key here as well. I think if you have, if you're very serious about instituting a program, having a designated person, um, and I think in in my mind the best person would be whichever surgeon is kind of at the forefront of establishing and running a program to also have some sort of a course in technical aspects of the machine, how to trouble. because you're not going to be able to have, you know, representatives like somebody just fly over from Japan, uh, you know, at the last minute to try and fix that problem. Um, so I think having that training about learning about the robot, the mechanics of the robot, the potential malfunction, malfunctions related to the robot and how to troubleshoot all of those, um, you know, in a short term setting before surgeries and during surgery, but also, you know, making sure that that equipment, that very expensive piece of equipment and technology is maintained over time and has all the regular upkeep, all the software updates, I think that that's very critical. But I, I think that can be addressed. You know, I, I think, um, you know, a few personnel, whether they're surgeons or, uh, you know, in the tech department or engineers, um, trained and handled. Uh, it needs to be a very trained technician for the current working mm -hmm. uh, and too much long time, at least one hour, to get all the things ready. So, uh, do these companies who provide the robot, they uh, get training for yeah. those technicians? They do, you know, I, I, I don't know about um, how they conduct the training for, um, you know, developing countries, but I know in places where it has been, has widespread use, for example, in um, the uh, scrub techs and the first assist and the circulating nurses go for, a, a, go to the same in a few other centers, some university uh, academic hospitals have um, uh, training the surgical scrub tech uh, and the circulating OR nurse goes as well so that they're very familiar with how to dock the robot, how to uh, change instruments, how to assist, uh, how to um, you know set up the whole platform, target the target anatomy, um, those are all things that, that should be a part of the training program, not just the surgeon, but the OR staff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh,
can make a comment about the maintenance and repair of the equipment way back about 30 years ago in Sarkar Shifa. I bought some two very basic uh, ventilators for the unit intensive care unit and a couple of months or a few months later one of them went out of order. So we called the technician or the company who provided us with these two ventilators. I said, well, why don't you check it and see what's going on? So about an hour, half an hour later, he came back. He said, sir, I can't find anything, but if you let, let me do it, I will open up the other one and find out what is the difference between the two. <laughs> so I told him, get the hell out of here. I don't ever see you, want to see you back. I guess we have come a long, back, long way from that time, but it may not be quite a bit different. Thank you. Any other top questions? Yeah. I, I see Dr. Bokas is here. Dr. Bokas did a uh, fellowship with uh, Navenza from Duke University. Oh. He is our urologist, and Dr. Athar Swaja is our Vita's uh, lab assistant. Donor kidney oh. harvest for them. I see the Hadi back in person. So, so looking at the time that we spent, I appreciate the interest of the audience. Uh, I'm sure that we learned a lot of good things. And the other day, uh, I had a webinar, Dr. Shazia, of, of a society which is the, uh, the CRSA the Clinical Robotic Association and they were conducting one to describe the scenario of what we have to open the patient uh, into a hemorrhage. <clears throat> so if you have to convert to an open operation and they were they were clocking the time, how much time that the techs used to undock and what was the time to open up to uh, salvage the uh, operation. So I think there are lots and lots of things that uh, needs to be looked at and discussed and you know go into the thought process of how we do it here. And of course one of the strategies, one of the strategies would be you know, just like in, in the proscopy and other expensive procedures that we do, uh, if the companies can get us the platform and we use their supplies, and that's how they come up with a model mm -hmm. of selling that technology and also making it more, you know, acceptable to the to the hospitals and so that we pay them a long period of time and we don't come up with it upfront. You can lease a robot with the region. Yes. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of one of the strategies for for our setup. Um, but I think that the take home message that Dr. Amir had alluded to is to be aware of and then for the younger colleagues would be to be aware of this technology which is out there and it's just a matter I agree a matter of time that is going to come to Pakistan and be acceptable wide, widespread but one note for the younger colleagues I mean just what Dr. Shazia was comment, commenting from the patient perspective, it's not the robot that does the operation. Okay? So it, it, it really is in just like in laparoscopy, it, it is the skilled surgeon perform the operation using that technology. And if you ask the surgeons, I mean, they would, it, it would be very difficult to scale back once you are you know, used to doing, you know, you, you know, you have to do a four hour operation thing and straining your entire skeletal system, sit down with your, you know, um, you know, you can stretch yourself and you have advantages of um, the wrist movement that the robot has 
and you can negotiate the very, you know, tiniest of the corners and the, uh, um, the views that you can get to perform a very precise operation. Um, one comment on, you know, how long would it take for a, a skilled laparoscopic surgeon to be proficient on a robotic console you know, one thing that I noticed, you have to be mindful because if you are using one instrument to retract a tissue, the row part would not give you that flexibility that if you perform one rash movement, it's going to tear the tissue apart, right? So, so that is an additional skill that you, you, you acquire. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, I think I would request all the consultant sitting here to please come up on the, please grace us and honor us and, you know, Dr. Masood Khan, who is the proud father of Dr. Ali, um, and then, you know, all praise to him for, you know, raising a very skilled surgeon. Ayn sir, Ayn, Ayn. Ayn.